Hello, and on behalf of VMUG, I'd like to welcome you to today's webcast. Today and tomorrow, together, Expedience Enterprise Cloud Native, presented by A.J. Kuftik, Principal Technologist for Expedient. Thank you for participating in today's webcast and for your continued support in the global VMUG program. Before we begin, I have three quick housekeeping items to go over. First, today's webcast will be recorded and available for you on demand. You will receive an email with the on-demand link, so keep an eye out for that. Second, a Q&A session will follow today's presentation. All questions will need to be entered in the question window near the bottom of your GoToWebinar screen. Third, there will be a short online evaluation that pops up as you exit the webcast. Please take a minute and let us know what you thought of today's session and what you might like to see going forward. All attendees from today's webcast who opted in at registration will be entered into a raffle to win a $100 Visa gift card. The winner will be contacted directly by Expedient, so good luck. All right, let's get started. AJ, I'll turn it over to you now. Thanks, Julie. Uh, good afternoon, everybody uh, on the East Coast. Good morning, everybody on the West Coast and whatever time it is around the world. Hope you're having a great day. Uh, my name is AJ Kuftik. I'm Principal Technologist with Expedient. I wanna thank you for joining me today. Uh, for those of you who are new to Expedient, we were founded in 2001. We started as a co-location company, moved into managed services and now cloud. We have cloud locations, US East, Central, and West. Uh, our West region just opened in uh, Phoenix, Arizona at the end of 2019. We have international cloud deployments on customer sites in Australia, Germany, and Canada. Our cloud is mobile, so we can place it wherever you need it to be. We've been a VMware cloud provider since 2007. Uh, that was formerly the vCloud Air Network, if you're familiar with that. So we've been in this, uh, in this program since its inception in 2007. We have almost 40,000 virtual machines on our platform. So we've been running VMware solutions at scale for over a decade now. And we're also a Rancher Platinum partner. We'll get a lot more into that later. So when we start to talk about the concepts of cloud native and why cloud native starts to become a thing, there's really three groups that we need to kind of talk through. And the first, and I'm guessing a lot of uh, folks on the call here are infrastructure people, right? And what infrastructure people largely are concerned with when it comes to things like cloud native are security and control. Infrastructure people by and large, uh, you know, since the beginning of time have been the audit point. How do I know that this is secure? How do, who's been granted access to things? Why were they granted access to things? And that's largely come through the infrastructure team. But by and large, most infrastructure teams know VMs, not cloud and not containers. It is a still fairly new technology stack uh, that is similar but very different to virtual machines. And so infrastructure teams are a little wary of how to be able to deploy and run those. Second, we have the business. And this nice businessman is very concerned right now that, you know, our legacy applications are really holding us back. And he's looking for agility and speed to market. He wants to be able to get out ahead of his competitors or at least keep up with them. And every time he goes to some sort of industry conference or you know, talks to his colleagues in the field, he keeps hearing about this cloud thing. And so he thinks that cloud is the way to do that. That may or may not be entirely true. And third, we have our developers. And our developers, they've heard you. They've heard every single user and they've also seen the inside of the application that makes them sick at night, which is that these applications that are 10 plus years old are starting to get creaky. They're starting to show all of their sorts of unfinished edges. They're starting to show all of the sorts of things that they've been meaning to get to for a very long time and just haven't. Um, and they want to keep up with new modern applications. They want to keep up with new structures because they're just as sick of the weekend change windows as you and I are. And so they want to modernize with freedom. They don't want to run on VMs. They don't want to have to go through all the audit processes and so on and so forth. They want to just be able to, to build, right? They want to go through and use all of the cool new technologies like containers and Kubernetes and Istio and service mesh and all of these things. They want to go use those things. But the infrastructure team on the other side is very nervous about that because they have no idea how to handle that. And so a lot of times developers want to push towards hyperscale clouds because they can go out there with a credit card. That usually ends up with the business getting a very large AWS bill and the infrastructure team being asked to secure and control it. And so there's a lot of different pieces of this puzzle and a lot of different points, but they're all kind of pointing to the same thing in the middle. And so let's take a look at what these developers actually are looking at right now. 
they're looking at their legacy applications. And when I talk about a legacy application, it usually starts with a base 1.0 product. Somebody came up with an idea and they said, this is a thing that we want to go do and let's go write this application. And as everything, you know, 1.0s are 1.0s. They need fixes. They have update 1.1 through 1.4, and these are bug fixes to make the application maybe a little bit better. Maybe they added a small feature. Maybe they added a bunch of bug fixes. And eventually somebody comes along with a new tent pole idea. We're gonna take product X, and instead of it just doing function A, it's gonna do function A and function B. And that becomes 2.0. It's a big major release, a big leap forward for this application. The application starts to get bigger. And eventually somebody comes along with an even bigger feature and it becomes application 3.0. And it becomes this massive application. And all of a sudden, I've got a ton of lines of code and my complexity of my application's going up, but my ability to do things with it goes down dramatically. Every time I wanna make a change to this application, I have to go through the big change control window. I have to uh, go through a bunch of different code reviews and peer reviews and, the application just starts to become a big anchor. And so what we need to do is we need to start to distribute that work. How do we distribute this work? How do we take this big monolithic application and break it down? Well, think of a big monolithic application like a big heavy weight, right? That's a hundred pound weight. And I'm sure that there are people in the world who could go over with one hand and pick up that hundred pound bar dumbbell, but most people can't. Most people don't have the years of training to be able to do that. And so what you need to start doing is maybe start breaking it down into a couple smaller pieces, right? Most people could probably move a 20 pound weight. Some people would struggle with it more than others, but you would end up having, maybe you could get five people to all move these 20 pound weights, or maybe two people doing it in two trips can move all of that weight all together. And so you can start to distribute this work and make it a little bit easier for you to make changes to it and for you to be able to move this around. And to break it down even further, you take it to 10, 10 pound weights and thus it's very easy to move. And most people can move that around very, very easily. And you can distribute that work into a bunch of different things. You don't have to move all 100 pounds at once. You can just move one 10 pound weight. And this kind of flies in the face of Moore's law. Right? Everybody here is generally familiar with Moore's Law, the former Intel chief who said that you know CPU processing will go will improve by X, and that X changed over the years. It originally was 4X, then it was 3X, and then it was 2X, and now it's like 1.5X every 18 months. And so as we've started to see this sort of go on, we've seen applications start to change. Right In the early days, you just handed your application sat on top of an operating system and you just threw pure gigahertz at it. The next time this this C, the application started to run slow, the next time you bought instead of a two CP a two gigahertz box, you bought a three gigahertz box. Well, then we start to run out of the limits of gigahertz, right? You can only do that so far before you run into heating and cooling issues. So then we started to throw cores at. And okay, this is a we have to multi-thread the application, but it's still one operating system, one CPU, but we're gonna throw four cores at it or eight cores at it. And we kind of hit a physical limit there too. I mean, even the biggest CPUs today or in the x86 world are 64 cores. So that's the physical limit of a CPU. You can get a NUMA and multiple sockets and those sorts of things, but still, there's still a very finite limit to the number of cores you can throw at it and how many threads that application is really running across. So then we started to figure out, well, not we don't just want more performance, we also want maybe a little bit more availability to that. And so we start to load balance the applications. And this is where we start to enter into the challenge of distributed applications. I now have multiple operating systems to maintain. I now have multiple systems to maintain. So we start to, as we've made it more powerful, as we've added more resources to it, we've also, We've also added a lot of challenges, right? We have a ton of challenges to these distributed applications. We have things like pure management, right? How are you keeping track of where all these things live? How do I know that everything lives in the same place? Do they need to live in the same place? Do I run them across multiple data centers? Do I run them across multiple clouds? That management 
is a huge challenge trying to just purely handle a distributed application. How is your documentation? How do you know that you're only making changes to one part of it and not all of it? So that's a big challenge. The other one is operating system patching. When we started, we had one operating system, application, operating system, done. I need to patch this OS so that VM goes down or physical machine goes down at one in the morning on a Saturday and it gets patched and then it comes back up. Somebody makes sure the application's still working and we move on. With a distributed application, you may have two, four, eight different operating system instances that you need to patch. And so that becomes a challenge to how to rotate through while maintaining the uptime of the application. Do you do half on Saturday, half on Sunday? Do you do one every day of the week? Um, that can become a challenge, especially when there's maybe a critical security bug that you have to push that patch out to all of them as quickly as possible. The next two go hand in hand, and that's configuration management and security hardening. This is where the application becomes a challenge, right? So we're talking management and operating system patching or you know, mostly infrastructure related. But when we start to talk about security hardening, how do I make sure that when I need to run this application on port 443 that every one of those instances runs on 443 and not five of the six? How do I make sure that when I push out a change to the configuration of the web server that it lands on all six of them and not four or five of six? This is a huge challenge and it, it's, it's like the step up in terms of application and infrastructure management is how do I make sure that I don't have configuration drift? And finally, scaling. How do these applications scale? Because it's one thing to spin out another VM, but what else has to go into that? Is there certificate changes that need to be made? Is there load balancer changes that need to be made? Are there inventory changes that need to be made, how do I make sure that as I scale the application to be able to support the additional workload that I'm not causing more problems for myself? And so this is where cloud native technologies start to come into play because all of these challenges are all trying to be addressed in the cloud native world. But let's start with what cloud native really is. And cloud native, even though it has cloud in the name, is how, not where. Right? You don't have to move into a hyperscale cloud or an enterprise cloud. You can do all of these things on premises as well. So you can do things and focus on modern development techniques. This is where you're using things like agile methodology, continuous improvement, continuous deployment, and APIs and containers to build a truly modern application. Because all of those technologies are all of those technologies and techniques are meant to be distributed. They're meant to be able to do things very, very quickly. I only want to make changes in smaller increments. And because of that, you can do things a little bit more quickly and you can adapt to change much more readily. So we have to start with the mindset, right? And when we think about this, I like to think about the concept of microservices. And microservices are very much like this chocolate bar here, right? When it comes out of the package, it's one very large bar, but it can be broken into individual little squares that all make up the one very large bar. So when we think about those microservices, we want to think about maybe say a retail site and taking this big monolithic retail site and breaking it into four parts, maybe say a catalog service, an order tracking service, a payment processing service, and a promotion service, right? I have these four major parts of this retail site and by breaking them down into those individual microservices, they can all be changed independently. And then you can start to get into the concept of stateful and stateless. Order tracking is stateful, right? I need to make sure that every time somebody places an order that lands into a database and that order can be looked up, it can be referenced during fulfillment when you know, the, the items are being packaged, but it can also be referenced by the customer who's wondering where their package or their order is. But things like the catalog or maybe promotions can be largely stateless, right? The catalog items themselves all live in a database, but you can refresh the catalog and change the catalog over and over again. It's just referencing that, you know, that, that actual database full of the items. And so when you can do that, you can start to make those independent changes so that when the business comes to the developers and says, we want to make uh, bulk ordering possible, 
okay, that's just a change in the catalog service and the order processing. That doesn't have anything to do with promotion, so we don't have to touch the promotion service. So we can just make those changes and make them make them smaller. And then when they find out that nobody wants to order um, chocolate in bulk, some people do, but most people aren't ordering chocolate in bulk, they can say, oh, hey, that was you know not really worth our time and it's confusing for our end users, let's remove it. That change gets pulled out and nothing again has to touch maybe the promotion service or payment processing. By separating out that stateless and stateful, that allows you to be able to be more comfortable with making changes. If I nuke the catalog portion of the website, I can redeploy it and get it back to where it was relatively quick, quickly. I don't have any data loss, right? I'm just not available. And so by doing that, you can start to make change groups and the business more comfortable with you making more, more ready changes than I'm gonna to be touching this application and through some form or fashion may lose data. Nobody wants to do that. And so that allows for the sprints from an agile process to be able to make faster updates to that application. Next, I wanna talk about the technology that goes behind this, right? I always like starting with the mindset because before you can even get to the technology, you have to kind of understand why you're doing everything. But from a technology standpoint, this is where containers comes into play. And what containers allow you to do is bundle up your application and your you know, side frameworks or libraries inside of that container that doesn't have anything to do with the, app, with the, with the base operating system, excuse me. And so that allows you to do things like maybe split up versions of Python. In a monolithic application and you're living on one server, you have one version of Python. So when payment processing wants to use Python 3.7 for maybe some sort of security reason, Order tracking says, well, wait, 3.7 breaks our breaks our part of the application. We have to go do a bunch of regression testing. This is gonna take some time. With containers, payment processing lives in its own service. And so they can go to 3.7 and not have anything to do with order tracking. And it eliminates all of that dependency testing through the rest of the application. This is also an opportunity to use best of breed languages and frameworks. And frameworks in particular, let's say that retail site has payment processing. Well, payment processing involves PCI compliance, and I don't wanna do PCI compliance because it's painful and it takes a lot of time that we have to spend on just making things compliant and not so much actually making my application better. And so maybe I wanna use a third-party service like Stripe or Square, where I can hand off all of my payment processing to an external party, they deal with all the compliance, and I'm able to focus on the other parts of the application that I think can provide more value. And by splitting all of this out and breaking everything down, I can actually do that versus having some chunk of my application that has to make that call out and receive that call and still have to be PCI compliant. And finally, utilizing a self-service elastic infrastructure because you can scale out and scale in on premises, but you still have to buy all of that hardware to support all of that going forward. And so utilizing an elastic infrastructure like a cloud, you can actually get the benefits of that where you're only paying for what you're really using. And finally, the management of this. So when we look at management, we want to make sure that everything is API centered because traditionally when you built maybe one large application that lived on one large server, the services are just calling each other locally. So they don't actually have to know how to talk to each other. They just kind of shout at each other. But when you move into a container world, each one is its own individual IP. They are their own individual worlds. They can talk to each other maybe on the same host, but by their nature, they shouldn't do that. They should know that they need to reach across the network to talk between services. And so that usually leads to being very API centered. This allows for mobility, right? I can build my container and deploy it anywhere. And it knows that it's gonna be able to connect to these individual places so that's the way that we should be building our applications. This also enables that third party service like Stripe or Square, where you're just making API calls. It's just another API call. You're just not managing that service. And then we want to isolate these things. So when we're building these containers, we want to build them so that everything that you need is inside that container for that service. Because if you're reaching across to other containers, you're making it so that if you have different containers for those different services, that's good. But if you have multiple containers for that individual service, it can be a little bit tricky and you're making API calls inside of your own service, which can be 
challenging. The other thing we want to do is make sure that we're not reaching down to a, a system level library where if I update that one, it could break multiple different services. So we want to isolate and make sure that everything that we need for that service is inside of that container. And finally, automation and policy, they go hand in hand. Right? We want to make sure that we're automating this whole thing because if somebody has to manually go in and spin things up and shut things down, it doesn't really do anybody any good. So if you have the capability to automate, you absolutely should. And that enables that scale out, scale up, and scale down and scale in from a cloud standpoint where you're really paying for what you use. And you want to build everything to policy. So things like prod dev test, where prod, I want to make sure that I have a number of different containers. Maybe I need N plus two inside of production, but inside of dev or test, maybe I don't need N plus one at all, right? So we have the ability to set the policy so that when we're building things out, it's always doing the right thing, that the automation is doing the right thing, not a person having to remember to do that. And for those of you who are feeling like, you know, maybe we're getting into the game late, you're really not. Uh, this is 451 Research's uh, survey of the enterprise, their voice of the enterprise. And they found that out of 470 respondents, only 17% have full adoption of containers. It's not very many, right? And only 32% have some adoption, but not everywhere. And so really from a container standpoint, 49% is some to full adoption. The other 51% are still trying to figure it out. They haven't even planned on trying it. In fact, 6% are planning to try out in the next two years. So you're, not, you're definitely not late to this puzzle. And Kubernetes is even lower. It's only 36% that are some or full adoption. The rest of that number, that's 68, 69%, have all of the actual, you know, those are the people who are out there still trying to figure out what they want to do. Serverless and service mesh are in the same boat. You're not late. In fact, I would say you're right on time because the industry is starting to shake out and starting to sort of, you know, coalesce around a, a large number of, you know, a large number of these players. Because when you start to look at cloud native, you have some choices to make. And there's a lot of choices. So and this is an eye chart on purpose, so don't feel like you have to read it. But this is the uh, Cloud Native Computing Foundation's landscape. And each one of these little boxes, so like this one right here, this is the API gateway box. And inside of there are 13 different companies or open source projects to just be API gateways. That doesn't include service proxies, service mesh, storage, network, container runtimes, so on and so forth down the line. There's a lot of different options here. The problem is there's no one right way to do it. There's a lot of good ways to do it. There's a lot of challenging ways to do it. So you don't necessarily, I can't tell you to go out and pick A, B, C, D, and E, and you'll be good to go. That's definitely gonna work. Because I don't know, because I may not know C, I may not know D. And so when we're starting to build this out, we want to make sure that we're making the right choices, but it may take some, you know, time. It may take some trial and error. Uh, things like, think about Kubernetes and Docker, right? Docker was the gem of the industry. But after a while of people loading Docker out, they started to realize, hey, this is, this is hard to manage. We need something to manage this. And that's where Kubernetes came in before Docker came out with Swarm. And so Kubernetes became the gem of the industry. And so now Amazon and um, Azure, Google and Expedia now all have Kubernetes services. You can deploy Kubernetes on-prem. VMware has uh, their Tanzu, Red Hat has OpenShift. So there's a number of different platforms all trying to wrap around open source. And so you have to consider whether or not it's worth it to do it yourself or take on a platform. If you do it yourself, yes, you can go out and do all that, but you have to also maintain it. So when Kubernetes comes out with a new version, um, etcd comes out with a new version, those sorts of things, how do I make sure that I'm updating everything properly? How am I keeping up with all of that? And it becomes additional you know, planned work in your environment versus taking on a platform or maybe you take on an Amazon Kubernetes service or EKS, Elastic Kubernetes service, where their Kubernetes versions don't exactly keep up. So let's look, when we were looking at building a Kubernetes platform, we really focused on stateless versus stateful. And a lot of times this is because traditional infrastructure 
is stateful, right? This is my application. It lives on this operating system, which lives on this virtual machine. This virtual machine lives in this cluster. This cluster is connected to this storage and these networks. And because this is a critical application, it goes into this backup job and it goes into this disaster recovery plan. And if something happens to this application, I have to either restore it from backup or go to my DR plan to get it back up and running. Everything there is very, very stateful. Everybody is very worried about server three. Cloud native infrastructure is meant to be stateless, right? We want to be able to take this container and I want to be able to blow that container away and have it auto deploy maybe the next version or maybe the same version because that host failed or whatever was running that container is no longer available. I want that container to spin up somewhere else. And so it's meant to be stateless. But when we were looking at this, we figured why not both? Why not try to come up with a way to do both of those things? And that's where our cloud native portfolio comes into play. So we partnered with Rancher, which is a managed uh, way to manage Kubernetes clusters and provides a lot of services around Kubernetes. Port works for persistent container storage and Elastic for our log management. And we put all of that on top of our VMware powered, vCloud director powered Expedient Enterprise Cloud. So your container hosts and your VMs run together on the same network with the same storage so that you get the same performance that you expect from your cloud, but it sits right next to your existing application. So you don't have to try and figure out how to network those two things together. They're all in the same place. So I'm gonna do a quick demo here. I'm gonna configure some storage and some logs. Uh, we'll configure a WordPress site, and then we'll take a look at some of the logs afterwards. So let's dive into this demo. So we start here in our main dashboard. Uh, this is our Rancher dashboard. And let's see, where is, where'd my mouse go? Oh, I'll have to do this blind. So <laughs> when we're looking at this, we start with our nodes. And when we look at our nodes, uh, we have nodes one through three. These are VMs that run on top of our enterprise cloud. They sit right next to your Active Directory domain controllers. They may sit next to your file servers. Uh, they sit next to all of the things uh, that you're used to running. Right? So when you need your containers to connect to those things, you're talking across the same networks, across the same hosts. So when we go back into our cluster, the demo is a mess right now. There we go, there's my pointer, and we're back. So now I have my, my cluster here. And I can go into my cluster metrics and I can see everything that is going on inside of this cluster. I can see CPU utilization, load average, network packets. I can see all of those sorts of functions. And if I want to dive a little bit deeper, I can open Grafana, which is built into this platform. And so I can dive into the performance of the nodes themselves and even get down to the container level. Now I'm gonna go look at our storage. And so Portworks connects to Rancher and creates what are called storage classes. And I can use these storage classes to create volumes, very similar to the way that you would create a VMDK on top of our VMware platform. And so I'm gonna pick on these particular two here, this REPL3 and REPL3 shared. These are the storage classes that we're gonna use, but these have a uh, policy on the back end that says, hey, anything that gets created with this storage class, I'm going to create the storage volume on the first host, and then I'm going to copy it to the other two nodes. So I always have availability, very similar to the way the vSAN works. And then REPL3 shared is the same plot, is the same policy, but the ability to write to all three at the same time, which is effectively how VMFS works, right? You have one volume that's mounted, and every time you write to it, whether it's from host one or host four, every time you write to it, you don't have to worry about SCSI locking or anything like that. You can just write to it and have the VMs all pick up from there. From a logging standpoint, we have Elasticsearch, and this is where we've put in our one endpoint here. Uh, we have a username and a password, and it's going to pass all standard out and standard error logs from the platform itself. And then as containers get deployed, those logs will go out as well. Any container that spits out the standard out or standard error, those logs will end up in Elastic as well, which makes them all searchable, even if that container doesn't fully get deployed. Um, that's really powerful when you're doing troubleshooting, trying to figure out how that container actually landed. Um, by doing that, we don't have to try to worry about, okay, is, are we getting to logging before this problem happens? That log is already being kicked out as part of the deployment. 
So we have our projects and namespaces here. Uh, if you're familiar with Kubernetes, you may be familiar with the concept of a namespace. Uh, that's a grouping of pods. Uh, Rancher has a concept called projects, which is a logical construct above namespaces where you can group a bunch of namespaces and you can provide access control and quotas to those namespaces. That's one of the big powers of Rancher is that it integrates a lot of the things that Kubernetes just doesn't have, things like uh, authentication, uh, role-based access control, logging, and all the other pieces that kind of fit around Kubernetes itself. So I'm gonna go into my default project here and we'll open up Visual Studio Code. If you're not familiar with Visual Studio Code, it is um, a more basic version of uh, Visual Studio, but it's free. I uh, highly recommend going and using it as a, it's actually very, very good. It's cross-platform, runs on Windows, Mac, or Linux. Um, it runs as a web server, so you can actually run it off of a, a web box. So it's actually a really cool, really flexible platform. So this first YAML file that I have here is uh, the port works volume for the MySQL instance. So we're going to we're going to deploy this. It's going to use uh, it's going to replicate three times. It's going to use the REPL3 storage class, and it's going to create a two gig volume. So I'm going to run this as part of the Rancher CLI. You can also run REST API calls. So if you're a developer and you want to talk directly to this through API through your uh, CI/CD pipeline, you can absolutely do that. You can run kubectl commands directly if you want to. Um, I'm using the Rancher CLI because I connect to a bunch of different clusters and it helps me not have to juggle uh, cube config files. So WordPress volume, same thing, but this has the shared parameter, which allows me to write to all three of them at the same time because these are web servers. And if I'm hitting a web server and I have three instances of the web server, they all need to talk to storage all at the same time. So this has the read, write, many access mode. We're gonna create a one gig volume here. And we'll drop that in. And we're done. So now I can come back into Rancher and go to volumes. And I can see that my two volumes are created. The MySQL volume is two gigs. The WordPress volume is one gig. And we can go forward from here. So now I'm going to deploy MySQL. Same thing. It's going to go out, pull down the MySQL image. It's going to deploy a database inside of it, create a called WordPress, uh, give it a user access account and set it up to be accessible. So now I've got my MySQL box here. And I can see that WordPress MySQL is now available running MySQL 5.6. That's the image that it used. We have one pod, it's up and it's active. And finally, we'll go deploy WordPress. So this is gonna use the WordPress 4.8 Apache image. It's gonna use the password from the MySQL pass secret reference that's inside of the tiny vault that's inside of Rancher. And it's going to point it to the database server. And it's going to create three replicas and utilize that volume that we created earlier. So now I can see the WordPress is deploying three different pods. And that's now up and available. So if I hit my demo site, I get the big WordPress install instance. And we're going to go through the site title, username. We're going to hide the password, set it to something else. And set up the email. And get that done. So now WordPress has been installed. And now we're being asked to log in. And now we're on the main dashboard of WordPress. Just that simple. This is using three different containers, load balanced by Metal LB, to power a WordPress site that is backed by persistent storage. So if I go in here to write my first blog post, I've now published this Welcome to Our Cloud Native Blog WordPress post, and now it's available. And if I click on the banner, I can see that my uh, post is now available. And here's the hello world post that comes by default. But earlier, I can see that this WordPress 5.4.2 was available. And, you know, I'm a security conscious person. I want to make sure that I'm up to date on my latest version. And so I have these three containers here. These are all running 4.8 Apache. 
And so what we're going to do is I'm going to change this from 4.8 Apache to latest. And I'm going to rerun that command again. And so now what's happening is all of those containers are being removed and fully deleted. And in the past, if you were running this as a stateless container, I would lose all of my posts. But because this was using the persistent volume powered by Portworks, I can now go back into my console here and it will say that I have a database update to do. And when I hit update on the database, it says okay. And now I can see that WordPress 5.4.2 is running. And if I go into posts, I can see that my posts are all still here. So I was able to make a change to a stateless application while maintaining the state of the actual content that lives inside of that site. And if I click add new, I'm now in the big fancy block editor that's in the new version of WordPress. And I can publish this and I can click view post and I can see, check out the replay of our webinar. And I can see that that is part of our overall posts, right? So create a new post, maintain the existing posts. And now we can go into Grafana, we can go into Elastic, Elastic Kibana, sorry, I've got that confused with Grafana. Um, but we have this ability to search and I can search for things like admin. And I can see all of the individual uh, logs that have come in that involve the word admin. These are all logs that come out of WordPress itself. These don't come from the container. Uh, this is coming from the actual interface of the container, comes up through Rancher, and then Rancher pushes it into Elastic. So I have all of this data, even if these containers fail to deploy. And if I go further down that rabbit hole, I can type wp-admin, which is the actual admin pane of WordPress, and I can see all of the instances of that. And I can start to use these logs to visualize that, create dashboards and create alerts to see who logged into the admin page on our WordPress site to make sure that we're not getting any sort of, you know, denial of service attacks or that somebody isn't breaking into our blog. And that's our cloud native platform. It is powered by Rancher, so that gives us all the authentication, container management, can even connect to things like Helm charts to be able to pull down images of existing applications, along with Portworx for persistent storage and automated provisioning. And we're working on disaster recovery as part of this so that we can make sure that your applications that are cloud native, that data, the actual important part of these applications, gets moved to another location and is available post-disaster. Elasticsearch allows us to centralize all of that logging, centralize all of that monitoring, and then our enterprise cloud is the platform underneath that is running all of this, that gives it all of its power and scalability so that as you want to grow your container platform, the physical resources can grow with you. And your VMs can run right next to it so that you have one consistent platform where all of your infrastructure is running that we are taking care of and maintaining for you so you can focus on the applications and delivering things back to the business that are more important. So when we go back and look at our big triangle here, we have our infrastructure team. And what they get is they get to maintain that platform knowledge. They don't have to completely relearn everything. These rancher nodes are VMs that are running right next to their existing VMs, so they don't have to worry about how to maintain those. And they get all of the audit controls, the role-based access control, authentication, that they need to feel comfortable when the developers are inside of the platform. The developers get an API front end. They can go in and run REST API commands against Rancher. They can also use the CLI and they get all the scalability containers so they can start to modernize their application like they've been wanting to for years. And the business gets the ability to move faster than the market. They're able to not only move their cloud native platform, but move their existing applications as well. So they can start to move forward and actually take on more challenges because they don't have to worry about all of the backend maintenance of the platform. And so in the middle here, instead of a big question mark, is our expedient enterprise cloud native with Rancher Portworx and Elastic. And this is all part of an overall cloud journey with expedient. So you have, you start with co-location, right? This is where a lot of our customers started. Be, even before VMs, we 
who started as a COLA provider. And so we recognize that physical hardware isn't going anywhere. People still have mainframes, HPUX, AIX, physical security stacks, and they want to maintain that capability. And so those physical devices can land in a co-location right next to our enterprise cloud. So you can have your physical and your virtual together, right? You could bring your virtual machines and your current applications and have those live inside of our enterprise cloud. You get all of the redundancy and reliability of a VMware powered platform without having to completely re-architect your applications to gain all of the cloud capabilities, paying for what you use and having the scalability and resources provisioned very, very quickly. And now with our enterprise cloud, we can power cloud native, where you can start to build your containers and your modern applications and have yesterday, today, and tomorrow together. So if you want to get a test driver, get some hands on with this, please reach out to me, aj.kopnik at expedient.com, or go to expedient.com slash VMware dash test dash drive, and you can sign up for a free trial for 30 days. You get 120 gigs of RAM and a terabyte of storage and portal access to that environment. So you get the rest, you can get all of the uh, cloud native capabilities uh, through Rancher, but you can also get access to our VMware cloud and have the REST APIs and CLI and Terraform and Ansible that goes along with the enterprise cloud. So you can try out our entire platform free for 30 days. Uh, and with that, I'm going to go ahead and open this up for questions. Got a couple out there. Hi, Daniel. Hi, Denver. Good afternoon, Mountain Time. Uh, so the first question here, how do you know how to scale the workload when you have multiple apps being used by hundreds of users? So this is where as a, um, this is where you as, an, as a developer, you as an application creator, you need to determine what your sort of thresholds are for needing additional resources. So when you have a, um, a capability uh, inside of your application where you know like after 100 concurrent connections or after 200 concurrent connections, we need to add additional resources or spin out additional containers. Um, you can actually do that as part of the Rancher interface um, where you have the, uh, that's actually part of the health checks. So you can do that and say, hey, this CPU is at you know, 90% for the last five minutes. Maybe we should spin out another instance so that we have uh, the ability to load balance across that. So it's part of, uh, you know, developing this and understanding your applications. It's not just going to say like, oh, after an hour, I spin on another container. Um, it's up to you to kind of figure out what your thresholds are for your applications and how to actually, what you actually need to um, make the experience for your users better. Uh, would Rancher work on a SQL server? Um, SQL server requires Windows. And Windows containers are a thing, um, but not a good one, if I'm honest. Um, Windows containers still need some help. Um, we don't support Windows containers at this moment, uh, but what I think would be really uh, helpful here would be to do th something like SQL Server as the persistent backend, but take the front end of that application and make it stateless and make it a cloud native application. So that way you can actually take this uh, to that next level of, I can make very quick changes to my front end application without affecting the stateful data that's on the back end. Do we need to have Rancher, knowledge of Rancher, Portworks, and Elastic to utilize Expedience Cloud? No, absolutely not. Um, I did not have experience with the, all three of those things about two months ago. Um, they're very, very easy platforms to learn. Um, they're very, very easy to take on. Uh, the, our Expedient Enterprise Cloud is, is VMware powered. So if you are familiar with operating VMs inside of vCenter, you can absolutely operate VMs inside of uh, Expedient Enterprise Cloud. From a Rancher, Portworks, and Elastic standpoint, uh, there is definitely a learning curve to it. Um, it is a new and different technology than what you know, traditional VMs are. But at the same time, they're very, very simple. Uh, Portworks, we set that up for you, and it's just a matter of you consuming the Portworks uh, platform from uh, Rancher. Same thing with Elastic. So it's up to you to kind of figure out um, the dashboards and how you want to visualize things. Um, one of our big capabilities as part of Expedient is our delivery and operations teams. Uh, we sit down and help you, right? We don't just hand you a bunch of services and say, off you go. Um, what we do is we go through 
and figure out the best ways uh, for you to actually um, take on that take on that platform. So we sit down and help you build this, um, help you migrate in, especially with EEC. We actually help migrate your VMs. It's part of the platform. It's part of the service. So there's nothing extra that you pay for uh, that's part of what we actually do. So from our standpoint, we want to sit down and make sure that you're successful and we're not just handing out, you know, go online, go to the sign up for a free account and go into our console and try to figure it out on your own and get frustrated. We want to make sure that you're successful. Uh, do you support different groups with different applications? Uh, yes, that's actually one of the biggest benefits of Rancher. Um, you can actually set up individual projects and grant only um, maybe group one access to one of those projects and they can have all of their namespaces under that. And you can have group two with their own project and their own namespaces underneath and all run that on top of one cluster. So they can manage their own things, they can handle their own um, applications and how they wanna build their own platforms differently than maybe group two wants to do. Uh, it's actually a really cool feature of Rancher um that i happen to really like um and i think it's one of the big things that makes it um easier to consume from a uh, enterprise standpoint even from a commercial it standpoint where you have a lot of different people who may or may not want to give up that full control um, the infrastructure team can come in and provide the baseline administration of the platform. The groups get the access to what they need to access, and they can start to build their applications without having to think about, okay, well, we need to make sure that Kubernetes 1.16.4 is running on this platform or 1.18.2. They can focus on the actual applications themselves. Still have a few more minutes for questions here if anybody wants to jump in. Again, if you want to reach out to me, um, aj.cuftic at expedient.com uh, to get a test drive scheduled um, or go out to expedient.com slash VMware dash test dash drive to get a uh, sign up for the 30 day free trial. Um, the trial access is to a, it's to an environment. We actually spin up an environment for you. Um, so one of our solutions architects will actually reach out and work with you on what you want to build inside of that environment. Um, it makes it really, really easy. Um, our solutions architects are very, very capable of building uh, cloud native applications. We actually did a, uh, a competition uh, around building cloud native applications. One of our team members built a, uh, a, a application that tracks his bike riding and pulls down that data into uh, a cloud native application and stores it because the uh, smart device that he was using to track all of that doesn't store data for longer than like 30 days. So he was able to automatically upload that, pull the data, pull it in and store it so that he was able to track his rides longer than 30 days. Um, so we have, we actually built all of that ourselves. Uh, this is our platform. Uh, if you see changes that you want to see or, you know, things that are missing, we're more than happy to sit down and try to figure out what we can do to make that work for you. We'll give it another minute for any last questions and then uh, Julie can take it over. I think that's it, Julie. Okay. Yeah, I don't see any other questions. So with that, I'll just say thank you to you, AJ, for taking the time to speak to us today. As a reminder to the audience, you will receive a follow-up email with the on-demand link from today's webcast. To find out more about the VMUG webcast program, visit vmug.com and check out the education page. And please make sure to complete the short online evaluation that will pop up as you exit the webcast and let us know how today's session went. And from all of us here at VMUG, thank you and have a great rest of your day.